Hi, everyone. Welcome to Second Act Actors. I'm your host, Dr. Janet McMorty, and I am still a medical doctor simultaneously trying to pursue a career in acting. This week, we're doing something a little different. I'm calling this Why Week. So you're getting two very special episodes this week, and this is the first of those two. So I decided to do this week now because we are heading into a downtime in the industry, especially here in Canada, north of the border. The seasons are changing. It's getting darker outside. It's sweater weather. I'm in my cozy sweater. I've got a bit of a sinus infection. Energy levels are low. We aren't filming very much and it's cold. So this time of year, I don't know about you, but as creative people, I know a lot of us can struggle with why are we doing this? Audition numbers are down. It can be discouraging. Why are we continuing to do this? So these two episodes are about why. Why are we doing this? Why do we do the things we do? Why do we develop passions and careers and go through career changes? Inevitably, like what is life, basically? Some deep questions. So I have two incredible guests this week who are not actors, but are incredibly well-versed educated and well-spoken about these issues that we all deal with. My first guest is Claudia Getzelman. Claudia is an end-of-life doula. So we've all heard about doulas at the beginning of life, supporting moms as they give birth, but Claudia works with people at the end of their life, supporting people at the end of their journey. Palliative care has been something very near and dear to me, both personally and professionally. So this was an intense episode, but I think extremely necessary. Why do we do the things that we do with our one precious life, the short journey that we have on this planet? Why, why do we do it? And what do we need to do to, at the end of day, say, huh, I am really happy with what I did with my life. This is an intense episode, but I think it's extremely necessary. I hope you enjoy the incredible Claudia Getzelman. story. Tell me how you got to where you're at now with your life and career. And then I want to delve into your fascinating career that you have now. <laughs> wow. Um, I'm going to make it short. Um, how, do I, how do I find myself here? Well, so photographer, creative all my life. Um, then I went through a crazy divorce where I felt I was dying. And I, I'm a very curious person. So I got really curious about death. And that sort of lent in my whatever pain and my evolution that I found myself in Colorado, in Boulder, Colorado, and became an end-of-life doula. <laughs> it's kind of, it's an interesting sort of, you know. But I got really fascinated, and I can tell you more about it. And then after that, I was like, so this is amazing to have these tools and the skills and to help people with the end of life because that's a really actually complex question and topic in itself but i felt like i needed some more um, education so then i started this did a spiritual life coach training and i started permission to bloom midlife coaching and then covid happened and i don't know i wrote this i came to my parents um, I didn't, nobody really knew it was COVID, but I wrote on this, on this cabinet here in this room where, where I am that I want to study with Dr. Gabo Amate. And, and I was like, I'm going to try. This is, I, I love all, everything. I followed him for so many years and I, he offered this program, started this new program, you know, Compassionate Inquiry. And so I got accepted and now I'm done with it. So I'm on this whole new path. Yeah, that's me in short. <laughs> so I wanted to pick your brain. Well, I want to pick your brain about so many things. Uh, my like doctor side is so curious about so many things. My actor side is so curious about so many things. But I mean, the big part about my 
podcast per se is the second act. Mm -hmm. So people who've chosen to change their life after living one life or one career. And like you were, we were chatting earlier before I started recording the transition Mm -hmm. and whether it's in the midlife, you know, numerically Mm -hmm. or at any point in their stage of life, um, you know, kind of making that transition and how difficult and tricky that can be, but exciting Mm -hmm. with your experience as a like midlife coach, like, what would you say to that, especially as a creative person? Like, what have you learned and what have you seen or, I guess, any wow. advice? Wow, that's a, it's a beautiful question. It's also a very complex question. Um, <laughs> I can tell you, maybe first I tell, I share my personal experience. So I've identified I yeah. as a photographer my entire life. And then I sort of had, I, I, I can admit it, I had a little bit of a burnout I was like not that inspired anymore, and and I my interest shifted because induced by this crisis, I I went through this death, you know. But in the beginning, when I did that, I definitely went through a very interesting phase when I came out of this education and would tell people that I'm now also aside from being a photographer, an end of life doula. I had this a lot of voices in my head and I thought, wow, now I'm going to be judged. And maybe people mm-hmm. think, oh, she's not a good photographer anymore and she needs to find a backup plan. You know, it was really interesting to come around and because it was my identity, this was my world. It was my my perception, how I identified myself as, you know, the way I perceived I'm a photographer, I'm an advertising fashion photographer. So it was a very interesting, yeah, it was a journey of acceptance, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, um, so the women I've worked with who would say, you know, in the midlife, so let's say women come and they like, but the, so let's say, you know, we all do that, not just women, ma- men, we all of a sudden, you know, we, we are in this phase where we, we find our careers, then we have the family, we have the kids, and then suddenly things shift again. And yes, it's mostly in the midlife, sometimes earlier, sometimes later. But there's suddenly this dissatisfaction also growing inside of us. And there's like, whoa, you know, hmm what's next what inspires me because maybe what we had identified with what gave us all that joy and the drive and the energy is suddenly not there anymore because things change and shift so then um, i would help we would identify you know how who are they what are these roadblocks what is it you actually still what is your you know how do you see yourself how do you see yourself in five years in 10 years in in two years actually just even and then sort of work backwards and create a plan of how this life this future life should look like and what that transition could be Mm. yeah i know i definitely myself personally when i was you know i still am simultaneously practicing medicine and pursuing acting as well because of you know that that kind of dissatisfaction and feeling like there was something missing mm-hmm. but i definitely had a lot and still do a lot of like guilt associated with that mm-hmm. because i do recognize there's almost well there is a privilege to be feeling dissatisfied <laughs> and having the opportunity to say I'm dissatisfied, maybe I can have a change. Mm. And then so I'm like, oh, I feel so guilty because there's a privilege there for me to even have the opportunity to change where I'm going with my life path. And then I feel even more guilty. Wow, that's interesting. Like, how do you, how do you, yeah, like any, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's, wow, that's, um, that's a beautiful observation. So, I think I, I, I relate, I can relate. Maybe I don't necessarily carry the guilt. Maybe for me, it's more on the outside because let's say, so I'm still also a photographer. And, but I gave myself in this process, I went through the permission to be everything I need to be. 
And I made a really conscious choice because this is who I am, right? I am a whole when I'm doing all of those things. And maybe for you too, you know, you love the acting. And when you when you can go and do that, it somehow that gives you that energy that you then come over to be a doctor again. And then you bring this fresh new energy into that. And then that, you know, makes you a better doctor in that sense, right? Because you're not mm. get bored or burned out on either end and it makes you appreciate both of those gifts you carry you to the world mm. and so i mm. see it this way now and sometimes i get still a little bit um i don't know uh i mean like maybe people, people get confused because let's say i you know you go on my linkedin profile and it says photography like and so the people who want to give me the work on linkedin and then suddenly it says permission to bloom midlife coach and then um, then my voices come back in my inner critic and then i'm like well maybe she doesn't do photography anymore so you know is it the outside mm. which judges you or is it our inner world how can we marry these two so different worlds together actually and make them you know live side by side as they are in with us right but we're living it you you living it i'm living it you know, I still love what I'm a photographer, I actually, because of the studies and because of maybe the, that break, which COVID in, enforced on all of us, you know, now I'm back and I'm like, wow, you know, I really love being a photographer. I love the collaboration. I love that creative process. So it made me, again, appreciate, really deeply appreciate being a photographer. So I'm, I'm just putting it out there, sort of... Um, maybe a sharing with an open-ended question because you know, it's something so personal we all have to figure out how how it lands and how we live in these both how we transition back and forth from both worlds right and so when you work with someone how do you even start that process because it sounds I wouldn't say the word overwhelming. It's more like kind of exciting, I think. But like, it sounds like it's a lot to unpackage from for people because there's probably a lot of there's a lot of feelings and a lot of thoughts. So how do you start the process with someone? How do you kind of get that ball rolling to start thinking about things like that? Um, You mean like in the in the midlife coaching process, for instance, or yeah, or or any. Yeah. Well, so hmm. If somebody comes to me and usually there is a dissatisfaction, there's a burn, I don't want to necessarily burn out, but maybe there is a, a lull in the end. Like, I don't, but usually people come, they're like, I don't know, something is wrong with me. I don't necessarily feel excited about anything. I don't know what my purpose is. My kids have gone off to school um, or college or I feel like I've reached the top of my career. Um, Now the house is empty. I don't know who I am. So sort of, and that offers a lot to work with because, you know, how do we identify, we maybe identified ourselves in a period of time through family life or being career driven. But is that truly you? Or was it just the past you were put on? And then as this sort of has gone its its way and, and, you know, fizzles out, and then there's this suddenly like, wait, what did I give up? Who am I? And so it's interesting to come back to maybe into an age period where we were 20, you know, and rediscover that again, but bring it into that nowness. Yeah. And I, I know I, my, so my, I talk about this a lot on the podcast with, again, creatives and people in this, in their second act. A lot of us come from a very logical brained mindset because a lot of people's first careers, myself included, were very logical. Mm-hmm. And so like going through medicine being like this is a this is a career path that is defined by society as a proper career Mm -hmm. you know doctor there i will be financially safe i will be you know you know lauded by society 
and so but then when you are trying to make that switch recognizing that what has made a huge gap in my life is the lack of creativity Mm -hmm. that logical brain kind of comes in and says still is nagging being like yeah but a creative job isn't a real job where are you gonna get money where are you gonna get this like because those are things we have to still have to think about in this world right um so how do you kind of how do you work with people to kind of blend that hmm but I think so I truly believe if we put any if we put our passion wholeheartedly into something, it will also make the money because people around our surrounding will recognize that passion. So I mean, let's say you come. Yeah, I mean, actually, you're the perfect example. You come from your doctor's career and you you say, there's all the voices. This is how that's your career. That's the money you're safe forever. Your retirement will be all set up. Don't you you don't have to ever worry if you stay on this path. And then your heart tells you, No, I, my passion is really to actually I want to be an actress. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. So but if so it's but if you really love that so much, and we all do that, if something comes to us, and we love it, we move mountains. And people will recognize because you're just there. You're so pure. You're authentic. Whenever you go to a um, a rehearsal or um, a casting or whatever it is, or try out for a, for a, a job, for you know an acting job, then you will show up. There's not like oh my god, I have to go there now. Ugh, another call call i don't know if i'm actually gonna get it but you're like no i want to oh maybe i could show maybe i practice something and you prepare and you're like i'm here i feel ready for this rehearsal or you know i don't know what the word might be for 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 that but i feel like and then it will also give you that what you need Mm -hmm. i don't think it's naive i really think it, it will You know, maybe, yeah, it's probably, is it harder? That's another discussion. Is it harder? Is it not harder? Being a doctor is not easy. Studying and staying put Mm -hmm. and having all the depths overhead is not easy. I mean, you know, so... (laughs) I'm just putting all these brainstorm thoughts out there. (laughs) Yeah, it's, well, and it, it's, it makes it makes sense, right? Like it's a lot of these things where you know when you hear it out loud, like mm-hmm. what you're saying, you're like, well, yeah, of, of course, of course. But hearing it just it just reaffirms everything that you know, kind of like I'm feeling and other people I've chatted with are feeling. Mm-hmm. And in your work as an end of life doula, for first off, though, tell me what that is. I have had experience with working with end of life doulas in some of my hospice palliative care work, um, but tell everyone um, what that is first before we kind of dive into some of the some of the questions I have about your your experience. Yeah, so end of life doula. I mean, everybody knows the birthing doula, you know, to help to birth the babies. Mm-hmm. And there's the book ends of our life, and there's also the end of the life. And now there is a fairly new profession. It's called end of life doula. So basically, you could hire me or your family could hire me if you have maybe three, six months to live and we could be together and make a plan how really find out how you want to, your transition from form to formless, your death to look like. Um, there is a lot of aspects of our life we don't want to address because we have a very... Um, strange relationship to death you know it's a taboo still even in 2022 we don't talk about it we're scared there's a lot of fear but if we would address this um this death which it's you know we all have to face at some point then we could really make it more of a celebration and we could also maybe you know find out what's the legacy what are we leaving behind how, is there some relationships we want to mend before we cannot do that anymore? Is it a place we still want to visit? Is there a dream you wanted to do all your life and you couldn't? So I would come help you. Maybe there's a playlist you want. How's the actual you know, period when your life comes to an end going to be? 
Do you want to be alone? Do you want to be in a room filled with sunlight? Do you want friends, relatives? Do you want to have a party? Do you, what music do you want sent? Do you want, you know, what is it you want? It's your last wish. And so I would help you identify this. And through this process, I truly believe, take that fear away and make it for, find that peace within you to also arrive at that very point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting. So my, my husband is an intensive care unit doctor. Mm -hmm. So he deals with end of life discussions a lot with families and has obviously tough conversations. I've had experience both personally and professionally having those tough conversations. Mm -hmm. And it, I remember, and I still get, as doctors, we can get very frustrated with people and families who kind of are like, do everything for my loved one. Na, 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 na. And you're like, oh, this, this could be so respectful mm -hmm. and lovely. And oh, it just, it's very, very frustrating because, because Again, I kind of feel like there's probably an underlying layer of, of guilt that we see from people and, and families. And I'm trying to think, I'm like, I don't have a question. It's more of like a statement. But I think, well, again, like you, we, we see how beautiful it can be in this thing that everyone is going to have happen to them, whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. And again, it comes back to transitions, right? It's, yeah. it's similar to the midlife transition as well, too. Yeah, beautiful. And I think this is also why I, I really wanted to use the tools I've learned, uh, you know, as an end of life tooler and really bring them to this here and now, to the middle of the life, to this. Because if we understand that actually there's so many deaths we get to experience throughout our life, and it's a practice, little practice mm -hmm. death, mm -hmm. it might be the end of a job. It might be the end of a career. It might be the end of a relationship. You know, even waking up every morning, right? Our cells have renewed. They, they die. And then there's, new, there's a new version of us, you know, even in a minute or in a second. There's always uh, something dies and something is rebirthed. And yet, we have alienated the relationship to death so much. And this is our society who tells us, you know, be forever young. We don't age, you know, death is somewhere over there in the far, far distance. And if you do this, you may never have to face it. So people have this really out of touch relationship. And then it becomes a heavy subject because we're like, wow. And I've been asked so many times, they're like, Claudia, why do you want to actually talk about death? Why do you even want to engage on death? And I was like, I don't think it actually, I don't think that it is a heavy subject because when I talk about this i also talk about life i talk about the aliveness because when i understand that death is inevitable that it will happen i may actually choose a different life path and maybe i will do the second act exactly that because it's my dream right and it will catapult me into this oh my god i should do this now what am i waiting for it's a short journey mm -hmm. And I mean, as, as you said, you have experience with that, and you know, and the most heart wrenching thing is when people tell you at the end, "Ah, oh, I can't do this anymore. Ah, oh, I wish I would have, you know, traveled more. I wish I would have told my friend I love them, or I would have just danced more, or I would have just not been so working so hard. I don't know. You know, there's so many things where people regret." Because what does really, what does it matter at the end? Yes, we need to make money. Yes, we live in the society. But what really matters is how well you lived and loved. And, when, and then again, I'm coming back to this. So when we have the courage to really think this through, I think that will catapult us into this dream, into this aliveness, and it will satisfy us much more. And then when death comes, we can say, I lived a pretty amazing life. And that's, hmm. that's it, right? That's it. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That, that's, you know, that, that is it. Yeah. And I think, so I guess, do you have any advice for people besides, you know, ignore what society wants us to do? <laughs> <laughs> but do you have any advice for people to kind of lift up and out of the, 
this feeling of I have to do the grind, I have to do the money, I have to do what I'm told, um, because that inevitably sounds like it may end up in regret at the end. Mm-hmm. Well, it would be good, you know. I think there's always we all throughout our lives think that we we get offered sort of these these breaks, these pointers where we get to check in with ourselves. And maybe the midlife is is one of them where we have a very tra- dramatic sort of shift in our like point of where we're looking. You know, we're looking suddenly, maybe you're looking into the present or you look more into your youth and suddenly there's this like, wow, what's next? Into this what's next sort of into the future. And really coming back through that what's next actually to the dream we once had and really check in is this truly how i wish to live and it's this is it's not easy i'm not saying it's easy it's soul searching it takes courage it takes bravery to do that but then there's this amazing reward so you ask me what what a tip you know what i mean i feel like okay covid actually offered us such a check-in because all the things we thought we need the travels, the shopping, the outside distraction sort of were taken away from us. And we realized, I think a lot of people realized what really matters is the relationships we have in our life, the community. And through that, that is a really powerful check-in. And a lot of people also sadly had to admit that there's nobody, that they're alone. There's extreme loneliness in this world, right? People the way also we communicate through our devices. It's a false belief that we're connected. And yes, we're very lucky that we have Zoom and whatnot, all these apps that we actually can talk to our loved ones. But a real hug, that's, you know, irreplaceable. (laughs) Playing a game with somebody, running around in a park, sitting literally eye to eye, you know, with somebody at a table or having a deep conversation that's again that's you know so that's that's a beautiful check-in so how can we if that is missing what is it how can we actually reignite this wish for a community what do i need to do to have this community how can i reach out to people you know around me how can i feel seen how can i help somebody i mean these are all beautiful sort of check-ins. I feel, um, you know, we're offered actually still up to this very moment. Yeah. Tell me, that's just, that's such fantastic advice. And I think what I tend to find a, a bit of a struggle when we are doing these transitions is a feeling of loss like you kind of go through a bit of a a mourning period Mm -hmm. when you're transitioning um like you were saying these mini deaths right every transition there's a fear that you might lose the community that you've built if you are transitioning trying to get into a into another community and that can be tricky I think I know you know I kind of have these two little circles in my life of like medical people theater people Mm -hmm. and never the two shall meet right (laughs) and so it's this I I know I definitely fear like if I'm gonna switch somewhere I'm gonna lose that part of me that community which is so key to me Mm. (laughs) sure but don't you think it could also coexist do they need to meet could Mm -hmm. they both coexist and be there you know these are your medical people and then you go and meet with your medical buddies and you talk to medical talk Mm -hmm. and then you and maybe there's another person maybe you find somebody maybe you could share and say hey you're also doing being an actress now and they're like wow really i always wanted to do that and so maybe you find that overlaying Mm -hmm. weaving in of of common um you know ideas or interests so i feel like we're also we're sometimes thinking so it's either or but why can not everything coexist next to each other? Because we are we are complex beings. We can allow, we can give ourselves that permission to be everything. Mm-hmm. As in, you know, and, but I think I trust actually. I know from the work I've been doing that we consciously need to give ourselves the permission. 
I am permitting myself to be an actress while I'm a kick-ass, badass doctor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Right. I mean, it's this, it's permission. It's like showing up in this wholeness, in this all of what you are. And when you step into that power of what you are, you shine, you glow, and you will tell the world. And that will attract also new people into your life. That's, and then maybe it takes me back to trust. Are we trusting our journeys? Are we really trusting what's coming? Because also another thing COVID really showed us, we always thought we are in control. We are in control of our lives, but we're really actually not in control of our lives. It was fake belief, <laughs> false belief, right? So now because of so many abrupt things which happened, we are like, oh my God. But there's this, there is this trust and the trust can is within us. And so I need to trust this unfolding i trust that i am making the right decisions and or even if something comes to an end that's like the seasons and then something else bursts again like you know a new seed a new plant and then flowering so it's just the cycle of of life that it's a coming and going it's a death it's a rebirth and also i mean you said mourning and i would even add grieving into this if we learn to grieve our little death we experience all the time then we can put it down gracefully and make space for it within us and say wow i honor this ending but by taking by letting it go i also make space for something new which wants to come in because i'm so much more than this one thing I'm allowing and inviting this whole new energy in. And that's a very beautiful process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> tell me about if you are, tell me about your work with Dr. Matei. Dr. If you Mate are comfortable talking yeah, about it. Yeah, of know course. This is a yeah. New, new thing. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm happy to talk about it. I mean, this is, it's, it all goes hand in hand. And um, it comes actually all together at this sort of midlife because I feel when we make this shift from to what's next, we realize that there's a lot of roadblocks in us. And often we do not know what these roadblocks are. We don't have language. We don't have tools. And there's, it, you know, and by understanding the way we grew up, going back into our childhood, and knowing who we actually meant to be authentically, then we can also again create this future, this life, this 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 amazing life. How we you know how, where we feel content and happy within ourselves. But we have to understand what our childhood was, and that's where the work with Dr. Gabo Mate comes in, the compassionate inquiry, mm. because often we act, live a life, we, tr we, be we carry a belief system that this is who I am, but it's just a coping mechanism which was established when I was a child in order to survive. And it's actually not truly who I am authentically. <laughs> Interesting. It's funny because lots of people I chat with, mm -hmm. when they talk about why they've gone back into acting, I would say 99% go, well, when I was a kid, I was always acting, always singing, always creative. And I know what the work with, doc, with uh, Gabor Mate goes deeper than just like superficially, I was in choir as a kid. Mm -hmm. But there's usually that underlying creativity that was there when they were young and then it's just was banished. Mm -hmm. And then now they're like, shoot, I want that back. And I remember that. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any, again, I'm just looking for more advice. Do you have any advice for, again, people who are like, it's, it's a struggle, I think, to try and bring that child back because they've banished it for good 
reason and bad reason for right. years. Yeah. I mean, we all have, right? I mean, do you, I mean, I'm going to ask you, yeah. do you have a relationship with your younger self? Do you talk to little Janet once in a while? Uh, maybe. I don't even know. So probably not if my answer is like, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I guess not. And because, yeah. you know, so there we are, right? Whatever happened. And often a lot of people don't even have memory because it didn't feel safe. So we have, mm. you know, this numbness mm. and coping mechanisms which make us not to remember what really happened in our childhood. But if we could reestablish a relationship to our younger self and really create, I mean, it really, it works. If you start talking to your younger self, you could, mm. I invite you to try it. She's first, she might first be like, wait, why do you want to talk to me now? You haven't talked to me in so long. But then you create this, you start this relationship and she will tell you what her needs are because it's that version of you, which is so, it's that authentic self. We're all born authentically and then, you know, life happens and it's not even the outside, but the meaning we give to what happens outside around us and it could be something minor it doesn't have to be a mm. capital t drama but it could be something mm -hmm. like somebody was making fun of you while you were at school while you maybe dropped the ball and you were alone with this experience and it was super traumatic for you so you gave it a gave it a meaning and the meaning you gave that these people didn't like you You were not good enough. And then through all of that, you became an overachiever throughout your life. And you always mm -hmm. had to, you had to be better. You have to be better. You had to prove to the world that you are actually worse the love, worse that you ha have a self-worth. And it could just be held in a tiny moment where the outside wouldn't even recognize that this could happen. But the meaning you gave it on the inside Does that make any sense? Hmm. Or is this too complex? It does. <laughs> it does. No, it, it does. It absolutely does, I think. Mm. And I think it's scary because, um, because it does make so much sense. Yeah. Right? Because, you know, you look, I love that idea that we're all born authentically, right? Of, co of course we yeah. are. And then all these influences come in and shake everything. Right for good and for bad yeah. but I mean given the fact that I'm talking to so many people about transitions in their life and it's your career like this is a thing that happens to people in society mm -hmm. we gotta talk more about it right it's kind of like you're saying with with the transition into end of life mm -hmm. it's these things but we we want to avoid it because it's uncomfortable because it will sometimes unpackage things that we've like you were saying if you talk to your your younger self you're like no no i've avoided that and there's a reason for it mm -hmm. but clearly something is lacking and it's common that it is lacking because there's so many people I'm, we're talking to about this. Yeah, and yeah, totally. That's exactly what you're saying. And, you know, we, we are such complex beings. So many of us, because something is comfortable, we rather stay in that uncomfortable container, even if it hurts us. Mm. You can say a job, a relationship, whatever the situation, instead of courageously moving out of that, Because that's the unknown. So that feels actually more scary because it's unknown. So we rather stay in that harmful or unhappy, but it's, it's comfortable because we know it. It's uncomfortably mm -hmm. knowable, if that makes sense. So we do that. And it's not yeah. easy work. So again, to suddenly start a conversation with the younger version of yourself or sort of digging up certain questions maybe which you know they come up all the time through our life i think we, we 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 manage we feel okay and then a little rock on the road and then we're like whoa what was that it's almost like a little burp comes up from our childhood right and then we're like oh maybe i no, that doesn't feel safe oh no i'm not gonna address that and we go back on into what we know into the comfortable situation so we tell ourselves 
until the next time. And each time these, these rocks in the road will become bigger because we're invited to face ourselves. We're invited to actually look who we are in an authentic way and step into that authenticity to live that life we're actually meant to be. And that might be being an actress. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And so for for people who are curious about about this mm -hmm. and are kind of resonating with what we're chatting about, how would you recommend people get started? Like are there resources or like how would you get started into kind of diving into this sort of thing? Um, so in, 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 con in conjunction or in connection to Gabor, are you talking about that? Like doing deep, the, just discovering the work, like doing some work about finding yeah. out who we are, who we're meant to be. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. well, so there is a beautiful v a film documentary Gabor released uh, last fall. And I think it's already 10 million people have watched this. It's the wisdom of trauma. And, um, and I put it in your show notes and it's available to few. And I, I mean, even just the trailer in itself. So that would be a great start. And then um, maybe journaling, you know, journaling is a, it's a very easy way of sort of finding out. I mean, if there, if there is a urge of I, that feeling I'm unhappy I don't know who I am I'm lost I don't know I, I don't know what my relationship I hate my job you know whatever the situation right so whatever that is like okay so we can this is how we start that's the point of the unhappiness but that doesn't give us the answer necessarily right away of like okay this is who I need to be but by writing this down and then also making another column and saying This is what would make me happy. When I wake up, how would my ideal day look like? You know, if I have a month, mm. how should I, what would I do? Or even coming back to the end of life, actually. Let's just go hypothetically into the scenario. You've got three months to live. What would you do with those three months? I think you will find a lot of answers which you can then take into your life and make some changes with. Absolutely. Yeah. And if people want to work with you, mm -hmm. is, a, is that an option? That is, yeah, it's an option, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's... Uh, how would we find how you? How would you find me? Um, I'm pretty active on uh, Instagram with permission underscore underscore to bloom. And then my website and direct message or email. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll put all the information in the <laughs> in the show notes for sure. Do you have any final words of wisdom, words of advice for people who are doing these transitions in life or trying to? I think trust. I, I really feel trusting. Trust is such a um, big component in this and truth. To have the courage to face ourselves Because on the other end, even if it's a little uncomfortable, you know, but a lot of things happen on the edge. They don't happen when we're sitting lazy on the sofa. They happen when we're on that edge, when we are, there's a driver coming out of, out of us. And so having that courage and have this honest inquiry and really ask ourselves, you know, who, I do, who do I need to be? Who do I want to be? Am I truly living my potential? Am I showing up to myself? Given that is such a short journey, even so we think it's a long journey, but it's, it's not really. And to live, you know, live that life. And then we're like, what really drives me? What makes me happy? What makes me jump out of bed in the morning? What would that be? Just to get curious. I'm just curiosity. And then maybe start writing and finding out that way. for tuning in and thank you Claudia for being my guest. Thank you so much for sharing your incredible story and a very moving experiences as an end of life doula. I think death is something, you know, we all have in common. It's literally the only thing we as humans have in common. And I love what you talked about about 
turning it not into a heavy subject, but that every discussion about death needs to involve discussions about life and being alive. This was a heavy episode, but I hope you enjoyed it. We have another incredible episode coming up on Friday, part two of my Why Week. Thank you everyone for tuning in, and I hope you'll tune in on Friday for the second of two episodes in Why Week on Second Act Actors. Bye!